Good evening, everyone. Time for episode 26 of Kerr's Rage, part 1 of the Dwarahim Staff Saga, by me. Starting at page 271, the top of the page. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Tarek again found the trail of the slaves among the tracks of the orcs and he believed that there were many women among their ranks. He led them forward in great haste, and the gap between them and the orcs began to close. <clears throat> At nightfall, they found the army of orcs encamped within the deep bowl of an abandoned pit mine. It was probably dug by gnomish miners in years past and later abandoned. Tarek found a sheltered cul-de-sac that would conceal their horses, while they scouted further. They decided that Tarek, Dow, and Kalor should scout ahead alone, because their stealth was needed more than their friend's skill at arms was. Leaving behind their heavy armor and cumbersome equipment, they all blackened their hands and faces with charcoal and slowly crept up on the orcs. The rest of the company waited and watched from a high promontory, in case the rescuers became in need of rescuing. Their task was far from simple, because the orcs were still over 2,000 strong. The three scouts crept and crawled into camp. Tarek was like a ghost animal or a weasel slinking into and out of some rocky vale, for an instant visible but soon invisible. Dal moved with the silent grace of his Lyo Selfar ancestors. The trees and bushes of the earth were his own blood, and they sheltered him in their concealing embrace as he crept closer. Stealth was an integral part of Kalor's profession, his greatest pride, and every object in the rise and fall of the terrain became his to hide behind or within. Despite their skills, the orcs were guarded adversaries, and they were almost discovered thrice, but luck alone saved them each time. It was well into the night when they finally came upon the orcs' long chain of slaves. Their guard was asleep in the thick woven rope that held his prisoners fast, was wrapped around his powerful forearms. The slaves were all asleep after their exhausting journey, and Dao's wife was among them. The human chain was some fifty long, and they all lay one against the other in their shackled embrace. Tarek wished that they could rescue them all, but they would never be able to free them quietly and guide them to safety without being discovered. It was because of this that they resolved to rescue Karina alone, Kalor would crawl ahead, the smallest and most nimble, so that he could cut her bonds sight unseen. But it would be most perilous, for the slaves were being kept in the open, where there was little cover. Sleeping orcs lay all around them, apparently exhausted from journey and battle, and all it would take was one mistake to bring ruin on them all. And so he crept his fear of discovery so great that his heart beat like thunder in his ears. But the gods of luck were watching him as he unsheathed his dagger and cut Karina's bonds, for the red orc guard didn't stir. Placing his hands over her mouth, he tried to wake her in silence. It was nearly their undoing. Waking with shock, she nearly cried out, but Kalor's grip contained her scream. Realizing that Kalor was in some terrible orc and antagonist, Karina quieted herself, quickly quieted herself, easing her body away from the woman sleeping behind her. Her face was difficult to see clearly in the moonlight, but Kalor could tell that she possessed a sharp-featured beauty. Her silver hair glimmered as she moved, and together they crawled slowly out of the clearing. Somehow they reached the wood line without being seen, and Karina joined Dao in a brief embrace. They then began a hasty retreat, moving as slowly and stealthily as when they approached required the greatest courage, for their impatience and fear made them want to escape in full flight. Their anxiety had to be held firmly in check, or their emotions would betray them through incorrect action. They were sneaking past the last perimeter of guards when they heard a woman's screams. They realized that without the protective warmth of Karina's body, the evening cold must have awakened her. Panic must have settled in when she saw her bonds cut 
and her companion gone. The need for stealth was gone. The savage baying of the Red Orc's hounds told them that it was time to run. The great mastiffs could be heard bellowing their challenging calls from within the camp, and the sound of a battle horn was rousing the sleeping army. Quickly, Tarek said, give her to me. I will carry her. I must stay with her, Dow said. I can't lose her again. She's too weak to run, and if we don't hurry, we shall all die. Do as he says, Karina said. The orcs are getting closer. Hurry, Kalo urged. Soon we'll be seen. Dow didn't argue, his own reason quickly overcoming his fears. They ran with the endurance born of desperation. Tarek's legs tore into the soft earth of the forest floor. He had developed his strength through a lifetime of training. His heart pumped with the ranger's unfailing determination. Dow and Kalor ran behind him. They were running for all that they were worth. If the dogs picked up the scent before they reached their horses, they would be finished. But the orcs were tireless trackers, and their hounds soon picked up their trail. Tarek could run no faster while carrying Karina, and his friends were hard-pressed to keep up with him even with his slowed pace. If it was up to their stamina alone, then they surely would have been killed. But they were not alone, and their friends had not sat idly by and waited. Tarek heard the thunder of horsemen, and he suddenly thought that his enemies had gained a cavalry. An instant later, he saw Carmen's hair whipping about her as she maneuvered her gallop, galloping steed. Dartin and Leander led the other horses, with Kerr atop the last. Dow leaped into the saddle, helping Tarek lift Karina onto the saddle behind him. The party of seven had suddenly become a company of eight. Racing away south, they found that way blocked by the orcs. Their enemy had fanned out quickly, trying to form a wide noose to ensnare them, to snare them in. To the east and west, the fires of many orc camps could be seen, and beyond those, the snow-capped peaks of the Dragon's Ridge Mountains. It soon became apparent that their only possible escape route lay toward the north. But the orcs had survived as hunters for centuries, and they were not easily daunted by fleeing game. When they had discovered that their prey had taken flight upon horses, they loosed their hounds. The mastiff's terrible baying echoed throughout the hills. To the south, there was no chance of escape through an army of orcs mobilizing to capture them. To the east and west lay treacherous, towering mountains, and they would find no easy passage over their frozen peaks. So they fled northward, deeper into the hills, with two thousand red orcs on their heels. They rode on for hours before they saw the hounds closing the gap between them. Great and terrible they were, with jaws the size of a man's head, and huge haunches providing tremendous strength and speed. Once they were loosed on the hunt, they couldn't be tamed save by their masters. <clears throat> we'll never outrun them over this terrain, Tarek said. We'll have to make a stand and hope that we can finish them before the orcs catch up. That hill by the valley's saddle looks good, Carmen said, riding on. Take positions on the hilltop. Darton and Leander, lead the horses to the far side and release them. Kalor found cover atop a jagged boulder of rock some ten feet high. Dow hefted his wife into the safety of a tall willow and prepared his bow. Kerr stood atop a large round boulder, hefting Prince Lauren's shield. He drew Corin Koth from his back sheath. Carmen stood nearby with her halberd ready. Tarek stood on the edge of the willow grove and strung his longbow. Dartin and Leander ran up the slope to join them. Despite their weapons, there was little hope of victory against so great a pack of hellish hounds. Med had once bred these dogs for war, but the orcs had found their savage nature to their liking and adopted them for their own. In time... The orcs bred them to be even larger and more vicious. These were the red orcs' warhounds, mastiffs nearly four feet tall, and they circled their prey with faithful hunger. When the dogs were fully assembled, the lead dog led the attack, rushing to the kill like they had done countless times before. The company prepared to fight. They were determined to live on. Unfortunately, the mastiffs only knew what they themselves intended, 
And that was bad for Carmen's Rangers. Carmen's fighters. <clears throat> One eyed Jacks. The hounds were terrible to behold, I said, with their great slobbering mouths full of teeth and their dull animal eyes so eager for the taste of blood. Tarek's battle with Erg was incredible, Eric said, but after such a harrowing escape, how could they find the strength to fight? It's true, we were all tired, but our fear had awoken an animal within us that would fight to the end. How many mastiffs were there, Garrett asked. Surely they could be no more terrible than dire wolves. They were not as evil of heart as the wolves were, but they were well trained and wild in their ferocity. If it weren't for Leander, we all would probably have been killed. And saying that, I drew a small pinch of red herbs from one of my many pockets and packed my pipe, exhaling a long curve of wispy smoke. I conjured an image for all of them to see. And there before us loomed those same highlands, and my brave companions with drawn bow and bared blades, surrounded by the orcs' warhounds, nearly twenty in all. It had taken me a lifetime, but I was now a master of illusion, and my image, though small, appeared as alive as the day that had happened, and as I told my tale, my conjuration moved with the speed of my memories. Meander. The lead mastiffs loped around the base of the hilltop, waiting patiently for the rest of the pack to join them. They had trapped their quarry, as the orcs had trained them to do. The time had come to run down their prey and bay proudly until their masters reached them. Slobbering in anticipation, they growled savagely and gnashed their teeth as the trailing pack members assembled. Tarek, Carmen asked as she cleared the leafy ground at her feet to make room for fighting, I have never been to these mountains. If we are to die here, then I would like to know the name of this hill. My lady, he replied, we are still in the Dragon's Ridge, and as for this hill, it has no name that I know of. This is Carmen's hill, Leander said resolutely. The hounds call their masters to the end of the chase, Tarek observed. See how they tighten this circle so that we cannot escape. Slowly climbing the slope, some of the hounds faultlessly followed the scent trails that their prey had left in their wake. Once they charge, Kalor observed, there will be no stopping them save for killing them all. Their fears mounted as the animals closed the distance. Tarek and Dow knew that they could wait no longer. Raising their longbows, they drew their bowstrings back and sighted down their arrows. The terrain was rough, filled with protruding boulders, fallen trees, and thick brush which covered the hounds' approaches. They had to seek out the most opportune openings, where their arrows would never find their marks. Leander reacted first. Having known many a proud, ca proud canine in his lifetime, he understood them. They were clearly savage, but also trained and used to obeying a master. With a tremendous shout, he raised his shield arm high into the air and cried, Hold! Loose not an arrow! Indeed, if Tarek and Dao had released a killing melody from their bows, then the Mastiffs would surely have attacked and ruined them all. They would have killed them or driven them into the trees. Either way, their days would have ended there. What powers of the mind Leander held over the beasts of the forest was a mystery to them. Whether it was the qualities of his voice or his posture, something about him called upon every being around him to stop and listen to him alone. Then, even more strangely, he dropped his weapons and ran out among the hounds, armed only with the long dagger that he kept at his waist. Kalor reached out to him in an effort to stop his insanity, but Leander's sudden move left them all dumbfounded. He's lost his mind, Tarek whispered in horror. By luck or the strength of Leander's gods, no one would ever know, for in that moment the huge dogs did not attack him, nor did they bellow or growl in anger. Dropping to one knee, he grabbed the nearest mastiff by his collar and scratched his ears playfully. Soon the rest of the pack was closing around him, lapping him playfully and begging for his attention. By all the gods, Kerr muttered. Never in his life would he have believed that such a thing was possible. Soon, Leander was rolling and playing with them in a tangle of canine bodies, 
and long lapping tongues eager to befriend him. Running among them about the hill, he praised them for their beauty and their strength while they played hide and seek. Finally exhausted, he walked them to the hilltop, where they followed him tamely around them all. Lowering her weapons, Carmen tentatively bent to pat one of them, as if the dog were her own. The two hundred pound beast sat patiently drooling, <clears throat> while she took his massive head between her hands and spoke sweetly to him. Tarek followed her lead then, as did they all. There was no sense in fighting against luck, after all. After a time, the hunting horns of the hound's masters could be heard from a nearby valley, and Leander knew that the time had come for him to release them. All right, he simply said. It's time for you all to go home. Go home now. Run back to your masters. Reluctantly, the mastiffs obeyed him. Turning back down the hillside, they ran southward, baying with wild abandon. Never in my life have I seen such a feat performed on hunting animals, Tarek said. Even the woodsman who taught me forest lore could not have accomplished what you did. It was nothing, Leander said. Somehow I could sense the true heart of the dogs. It was a simple matter for me to release them from their command to hunt. Simple, says he, Kerr said. Simple, Carmen said knowingly. Then let's make haste, Artin said, before the beast's masters chastise them and send them after us once again. You have always been wise, Kalor joked. But which way to travel but which way do we travel and escape? Dow said. North, Carmen pointed with excitement. The scepter points there. Kalor had ignited the scepter and divined once more that their quest's end lay somewhere to the north. Then the orcs, Tarek said, do not yet have what they seek. If we hurry, Kerr said, we can beat them to that treasure. Without the scepter, Kayla said, there's, they've little chance of finding the staff. But they know the path that we followed, Tarek said, and they'll hunt us to the end. I don't want to subject Karina to any more danger, Dow said. Speak for yourself, Moshir, Karina said. I can handle a sword as well as any man. Besides, Carmen said, there's no chance of escape to the south through two thousand orcs, nor east and west. The mountains there will soon be impassable with snow. If we must flee northward, we may as well see this quest through to the end. This is madness, Dow said. We'll be headed right into the orcs' tribal lands. Then now is the time to set off on your own, Kalor said. If you make for the mountains, you might still be able to find a safe passage before the winter snows. It is also possible, Tarek said, the two people might be able to make their way south through the Orkin host. Staring at Dow in anger, Karina spoke many words to him with her look alone, and although she was exhausted and hurt, she'd never known her husband to be a coward. He was only thinking of her safety, and she was very capable of caring for herself. Her companion's eyes had all fallen on Dow, and he once, and he looked upon, oh, I'm sorry, her companion's eyes had all fallen on Dow, and he looked once upon her and then upon the others. All right, all right, we'll join you in this foolish journey, this quest for the Dwaradim staff. <clears throat> the Dragon's Ridge. Tarek led them in their flight. He used all his wood lore to conceal their trail and to hide from the noses of the orcs' hounds. When they came upon a stream, they would travel through it to avoid leaving a scent trail, and then they would leave it only when they came upon a rocky place that would leave no sign of their passing, camping by day and riding by night. They dragged large branches behind them to stir leaves over their path. They spoke little and made no fires. Kalor's pipe remained unlit. They used all these techniques and more, but Tarek knew that they were only buying time. Eventually the orcs would catch up to them, and then they would have to fight. Somehow, they managed to reach the pinnacle of the Dragon's Ridge Mountains unharmed. Gray clouds hung low in the sky, and the crisp, clean smell of the coming winter was in the air. The urgent pull of the scepter had led them to the edge of a towering cliff, overlooking a vast forest of mighty trees beyond which lay the long expanses of the northern tundra, 
the sacred lands of the red orcs. The forest below them was vast, and its towering spires of northern spruce and cedar made them all feel tiny and inconsequential. Far away to the northwest, near the horizon, a great pyramid could be seen rising from the land. It was tall and black, like a captured shadow, for somehow it seemed to absorb all the light around itself. In the forest to the northeast, a stone tower could be seen standing just above the treetops. It was an awesome scene, and they suddenly felt truly vulnerable. This was a land into which none of them, nor any of their forefathers, had ever ventured. We need to get off of this mountaintop, Tarek said. Our silhouette will be visible for miles. They rode east for a time along the mountain crest until Tarek spied a way down. The slope was dreadfully steep and strewn with treacherous loose stones. But Tarek's eye for the land was true, and they all descended safely. The trail was winding and arduous, requiring some hours of tedious work by both man and beast. By the late afternoon, they had reached the tree line of the valley forest and discovered a sheltered cleft in which to camp. We'll camp here for the night, Tarek said. It's too risky to enter these unknown woods in the dark. If any of ye be wondering, Kerr said, this forest has many names, but the dwarves call it Dreadmoor. The trees are so thick and vast that sunlight rarely shines upon the forest floor. Few creatures can live there but those that do are said to be dark and evil indeed. Kalor used the scepter once more, and it still pointed ever north. He somehow sensed that it pointed to some destination beyond the orc's tribal lands, somewhere deep within the northern reaches. It was a place of glaciers, eternal snow and legends, a region into which none of them had ever gone. You sense that it leads us there, Kerr said, pointing, don't you? There's no way to be sure. I can feel it. Something calls me from those hills, something from the ancient history of my people. The mountain dwarves lived in the northern reaches. It is only a legend. Dwarven Crest is said to lie somewhere in those hills. Dwarven Crest? The fortress of Baldric, grandsire of the dwarves. I see the glimmer in your eyes. Maybe our journey takes us takes us there. Could be, was his reply. Examining his axe, he held it as if listening to voices that only he could hear. When he was seemingly satisfied, he went about inspecting his gear, as he always did. And that's where we'll end episode 26, at the top of page 282. And that's where we'll begin episode 27. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of Kerr's Rage. And as always, read Kerr's Rage, Part 2, The Drums of Doom. Part 3, The Last Admiral and The Ice Moon, which should be out in the middle of September 2020. Thank you for listening and have a great night.